So in this talk, my, my goal will be to hopefully convince you that uh, this model I'll be about to present is interesting. There's lots of questions that we don't understand, and I try to put some emphasis on those to get some uh, feedback from the excellent audience uh, here on, on this topic particular and uh, I'll also tell you what we what we are able to understand and um, okay so let me first uh, begin describing what the model is I don't, we, we start with a finite graph let's say G which uh, consists of vertices lambda and edges e let's say it's finite for the moment um, and then uh, we consider uh, forests, which are just uh, subgraphs uh, having the same vertex set as the original graph and a uh, subset of the edges. Um, so a forest is a subgraph. It does not have any cycles. Um, so forests are uh, often also called spanning forest. I'm trying to avoid the so spanning here means that the vertex set is the same vertex set as the original graph. Um, but there's different uh, meanings of the term spanning forest in different contexts, and it can mean something different. So I'll avoid that that term. You're just going to say forest. But, so, but, but then you can have empty. You can so, yeah. So, so yes. Yeah, so in other words, the uh, forest is a. Uh, the connected components are trees, but trees can be empty. Okay. So you may have you may have, may have connected components with just a single. So it feels funny in the sense that each side belongs to something. It may belongs be to some kind of yeah. yeah. points. Yeah. Exactly. Not not each point is in a. That's the other uh, uh, use of the word spanning force, where every every uh, vertex is in a uh, in an edge, which is not necessarily uh, the case here. Okay, so these, uh, these, so and then the, the the probability measure that we consider is, um, is is supported on force and assigns a probability uh, a proportional to a parameter of beta to the number of edges in the forest um, uh, to each forest. So um, and uh, I'd like to put in leaving some space here because I. Uh, make a little add-on in a second. I'd like to write this also that there's an indicator function that f is the force. Um, so this is the model we're considering and uh, goes under various names, but the name we like is uh, it's called is the arboreal gas. Uh, uh, this this term I think goes to uh, Caracciolo, Jacobson. Seller, Sokol, and Sportiello, uh, who used this term. Um, Did they invent that term? They invented that term, I believe. Um, um, <laughs> and, green. Sorry? It's green. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is the model. And uh, maybe for future use, let me, uh, so in beta, of course, is a, is a positive. And uh, for future use, let me, maybe I, this is the point where I can use color. Uh, it's also a useful variation of this model, uh, which, is, uh, which includes an external field. And you get this variation by adding an additional uh, so-called ghost vertex to the vertex set and uh, looking at the force measure I had before on this uh, uh, graph with the ghost vertex added, but now the, uh, parameter beta for every uh, edge is replaced by H for the connections to the ghost vertex. And so the effect of this is that here you, you can uh, write this equivalently uh, without ref a reference to the ghost vertex by putting a product here where here's the product and writing T in F, meaning T is a tree in the force. So T, T is a connected component of, uh, uh, of the force. And then I'm putting one plus H now I didn't leave enough space. Uh, uh, the number of vertices in each component. So, if you, so this would be a very useful uh, 
device is an external field. Uh, okay, so this is the model. This is the Avoria gas, or also, okay, let me not go into it. other names it's known by, but um, let me say uh, how, what this model is related to. If you uh, drop this indicator function, um, so if you just replace that by one, um, uh, then this is just Bernoulli bond percolation. Uh, so this is. Uh, if you like to write one plus x exponential of x. Yeah. So in bond percolation, so let's drop the external field for the moment, uh, uh, and uh, if, uh, then it's Bernoulli bond percolation with uh, probability uh, that each edge is kept is uh, beta divided by one plus beta. So, or said differently, the boreal gas is uh, just a bond percolation conditioned not to have a uh, uh, condition to be a forest. Uh, another variation is you replace this indicator function by uh, Q to the number of components. Uh, of, uh, of the graph. So in this case, um, um, uh, again, uh, you would typically uh, also replace a beta uh, by uh, e to the beta minus one, maybe. And then this is uh, the random cluster model. And um, in fact, it's it's natural to so this and the beta that appears here is uh, is the beta from the relation between the random cluster model and the POTS model. But I, I'll get I'll get there later. I'll explain this later. Um, I like to put another Q here. It doesn't look, it doesn't really matter. It just changes the value of beta by a constant. But if you do that, then uh, the Borel gas is the Q to zero limit of the random cluster model. Um, the Borel gas is, is the Q to zero limit of the random cluster model, uh, or it's a bond percolation condition not to have any uh, cycles. Wait, how does it? How does taking Q to zero capture the indicator of the forest? Well, uh, it basically uh, it's it's not immediate, but it's it's easy to see. Uh, you it basically enforces that. I mean, and each uh, forest uh, is characterized by a relation between the number of edges. Where, with respect to the vertices, you can see if you take Q to zero. Um, you need E to be V minus K. Sorry? You need the number of edges to be the number of edges <laughs> minus the number of connected components. Yes, yeah. that, that's, that's what this will uh, enforce. With the H. Let, leave out the H for now. Uh, the H is best thought of as an add-on. You first do this without the H, then you add an additional ghost vertex and with uh, weight H in this case, and then uh, this uh, factor of the H is, is whatever comes out. That's like a magnetic field. Right? Yes, it would be a magnetic field. <laughs> okay, so, um, so that, that's the model. Um, the question we're interested in is, um, uh, when is there a macroscopic cluster? So this is a model of a random graph. It has, uh, consists of uh, possibly many components. Um, they can be small or large. And the, what we like to know is when there is there a component that covers a positive fraction of the, of the vertices of the original graph. Okay, tree. So in other words, when, when does the Evora gas percolate? And um, there's one fact, um, uh, which is that the Evora gas is uh, stochastically dominated by uh, Bernoulli bond percolation with this uh, parameter. So, um, So 
So in particular, when beta is small, or P is less than the critical value for percolation, all clusters are fine. Uh, so uh, for beta small, there is no macroscopic uh, component. Um, but for beta large, uh, there can, can be. And um, um, so all clusters. Um, okay, so when beta is large, there can be uh, uh, macroscopic components, and um, there are um, cases where this is known. Um, what is the complete graph? So for um, complete graph, um, and so this is uh, Luchak and there's some uh, further work by uh, James Martin and Yale, and I get back to this case later on when I discuss all the things we don't know, and it's also known on expander graphs. The case where the cases we're interested in is uh, when uh, the graph is uh, basically a finite dimensional lattice. So uh, let's say uh, a large portion of Z ZD or, or B dimensional torus. When you say for expanders, you mean that in some kind of a limit of going graphs? Yes. So yeah. the sequence of graphs. Uh, yeah. So, so would it also? So it would also apply to the for the for a random irregular graph. Yes. From the, yes. Okay. Um, so here's the the two main um, uh, uh, results. So I should say uh, uh, all of this uh, work is uh, joint work with uh, Nick Crawford, uh, Tyler Helmut, and. Uh, Andrew Swan, half of it with Andrew. Um, so the first uh, uh, result is that in, in two dimensions, uh, there are no macroscopic uh, components. On the graphs, um, there is no. Microscopic tree, any beta. And um, more precisely, um, look at the connection probability, say, on a, on a finite, uh, a large finite subset lambda of uh, Z2, then this connection probability decays uh, some small polynomial uh, rate at least. Um, the conjecture is exponential, but I'll try to get there later again for any beta. Um, so this is the situation in two dimensions. Macroscopic clusters don't exist. You mean Z2 lattice? Or? Well, I mean, uh, uh, say, a two-dimensional torus of site length L and L large, or a finite domain. And, uh, and but what is the graph? Yes, uh, two-dimensional lattice, Z, Z2, but it doesn't really, ah, Z, Z, Z2, it doesn't, Z2 it doesn't, modulo, Z2 modulo some yes, yes, it okay. doesn't actually matter that much for this, this result, this is pretty robust, uh, anything that, basically anything that looks, uh, where the simple random walk is uh, recurrent, essentially, okay. there's no, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is contrasted by uh, the, what happens in dimensions three and higher, so in dimensions three and higher, we, we restrict 
to a, let's say a convenient uh, family of graphs. So we looked at it in a three-dimensional or higher dimensional torus, um, uh, ZD, and uh, it's convenient for technical reasons to take a torus of a exponential a sequence of tori whose uh, length go in an exponential well way and l is the fixed uh, is, a, is a large but fixed um, uh, number here so we're looking at a sequence of tori going to infinity and in this case where we can show uh, among other things is so here i'm looking for the right p beta let's say I'm referring to the uh, case where there is no external field, but the external field would come later. It's, it's a useful uh, device. So in this case, we can, this is, uh, is uh, different. There's a leading term, which I'm denoting by th theta beta squared. And this term is going to be one minus order one over beta. And then uh, there are corrections, providing um, it's two C of beta, where C of beta is a function that's bounded as beta uh, goes to infinity. And then there is a, a free field like uh, decay term. And uh, then there are lower order corrections, which um, something like one over x to the d minus two kappa for some small kappa and then there's also a finite volume um, so in particular this statement means that in three dimensions on the sequence of tori there there is a macroscopic uh, a tree uh, uh, of density theta squared and the corrections to the connection probability decay polynomial as opposed to what you would get in an ordinary percolation. Right? Yes, an ordinary percolation in the supercritical phase, which is the analog for the correction would be exponential. Um, and um, okay, so now uh, these two results uh, will look familiar to many of you uh, uh, coming from the statistical uh, physics. Uh, the first theorem is essentially a version of the Merman Wagner theorem. And with the second, second theorem, it's the same type of behavior that we uh, know or expect to happen in, in spin systems with continuous symmetries like the, like the Heisenberg model um, at low temperature. And um, that turns out is not a coincidence. Um, So I, I'm just passing much more quickly than I was hoping, but I think it's instructive to make the analogy with the POTS model. So the POTS model um, defined for an integer Q, which is two, three, four, and so on. And uh, it's a model where there is, a, a, one might call it a color, sigma, associated to every vertex of the graph. So sigma x, where x is the vertex, takes values in one to q. Uh, the Gibbs distribution of the POTS model is uh, given by uh, taking the exponential of um, uh, beta sum over all edges of the graph. Uh, and then there is the indicator function that the two colors at neighboring vertices are the same. And so this is with respect to the counting measure on all, all such configurations. So that would be the, um, the POTS model. Um, maybe. So in other words, um, the expectation of, an, of, a, of a random variable under the POTS model is uh, proportional uh, to the sum. Um, this, there's another way uh, to write this, uh, this, uh, this sum, which is uh, uh, 
sometimes called the tetrahedral representation of the POTS model. So rather than thinking of the spins as numbers one through Q, uh, one can think of them as points on a simplex uh, with Q consisting of Q points that's embedded in R to the Q minus one. So this, this term can equivalent be written as e to the beta sum over edges. And in fact, I'd like to put a, a factor Q here as well. Again, it doesn't matter by changing beta, but this way it'll have the right continuity as Q goes to zero. Um, and then uh, writing this as ux dot ui, where now ux uh, uh, for every vertex x is a element in RQ minus one uh, that in fact lies on the simplex and convenient to use a normalization where um, uh, the points on the simplex are in fact on a sphere of, uh, of um, radius uh, uh, Q minus or radius squared Q minus one. And if you take uh, uh, two uh, two spins that uh, diverge, so two points on the tetrahedron that are different, you get minus one. Um, So this is the tetrahedral representation of, of the POTS model. And the relation to the random cluster model that we saw on this board, which I have just erased, is that the spin-spin correlation of the POTS model divided by one minus Q minus one is equal to the percolation probability in the random cluster model. Now, uh, this construction makes sense when Q is at least two, um, but it turn and um, turns out uh, there is uh, is a version of this that is uh, that is exactly analogous to the statement, but holds for Q equals zero. And I'm going to explain what that is uh, now. And as it turns out, as Q goes to zero. Somehow, the um, so maybe one point I should mention. Uh, so this is a spin system where the symmetry group is SQ, the symmetric group on Q elements. As it happens, somehow as Q goes to zero, uh, the symmetric group on Q elements becomes continuous in this process. And let me explain what this model is. So to see where this is uh, coming from, I, I, I will explain what this model is in a second, but I um, let me first mention the, uh, hyperbolic sigma model. It was uh, studied by uh, Spencer and Zirnbauer. As it, it turns out, this Q to zero uh, limit of the POTS model is uh, very much related to these models. Um, so what are these models? So in these models, the spins are not taking values in the tetrahedron, but they're taking values in the hyperbolic uh, plane. So for every vertex X, there is a spin UX, which takes values in the hyperbolic plane H2 which we think of as embedded into R3, or R2 plus one, if you prefer. So um, this is, um, I didn't say phi one, phi two, there's two components in this direction, and here I'm writing Z. Um, uh, and um, you can realize the uh, hyperbolic plane H2 as this hyperboloid uh, embedded into R3, um, uh, so writing ux as phi x1, phi x2, zx, with the constraint, so this is an, uh, with the constraint that um, 
ux in our product ux is equal to minus one, where the inner product here is the Minkowski inner product. So ux of uy is uh, phi x1 phi y1 plus phi x2 phi y2 minus zx. And uh, we're also imposing that uh, z is positive, so we get only the one of the two hyperboloids that are satisfied by that is given reason uh, to by this constraint. And then, so so these are the the spins. So for every vertex, we have a spin in the hyperbolic plane. And uh, simplex or no, 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 just hyperbolic plane. Just continuous, completely continuous. And the expectation of a function, now f is a function on uh, 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 one copy of the hyperbolic plane per vertex. And um, the expectation is proportional and formally looks the same as the one above. So e to the beta, sum of x, y, u, x, y. Um, and then in this case, it's more important than in other cases to also add an external uh, magnetic field, uh, take this form, and then integrating over one copy of the hyperbolic plane per vertex, and this measure du is the Haar measure on H2. Okay, so this is the um, hyperbolic uh, sigma model. Um, maybe one uh, small um, uh, additional um, point I would like to explain, which is that this Haar measure, so the hyperbolic plane is, is uh, two-dimensional, right? So you can parametrize it by two variables and it can, for the purposes of this explanation, a convenient parametrization is just using these variables, uh, phi, sorry, these are this way, phi one and phi two are here. And Z is uh, this one. Uh, I'm just going to use uh, this uh, copy of R2 as, as parametrizing the hyperbolic plane. So uh, and if you do that, the Haar measure just becomes uh, d phi x, two dimensional debate measure, divided by Zx, which I now view as a function of phi x. This function of phi x is uh, square root one plus five square. Um, so um, this is just uh, parametrizing this integral in, in coordinates, uh, which I get just given in terms of two real numbers. Okay, so um, that's the hyperbolic sigma model. And as it turns out, um, the um, Q, equals zero POTS model is a fermionic version of, of this hyperbolic sigma model. And so what does that mean? What is the fermionic hyperbolic plane? H02. So this, um, well, we uh, take two anti-commuting or Grassmann variables, uh, xi x and eta x, every uh, vertex and lambda. So these uh, xi x and eta x, they are they all anti-commute with each other. There's two n anti-commuting variables. So in other words, they are in um, exterior algebra. Uh, and then we go back to the definition of the hyperbolic sigma model and we replace uh, phi one and phi two by psi and eta. Just more concretely, zx, which is this definition, becomes square root one minus two psi x eta x. And this square root, is simply defined by uh, Taylor expansions. And these, uh, these are anti-commuting variables. So this Taylor expansion terminates after one term. So this is one minus psi x eta x. And the uh, Minkowski in our product, ux, uy, uh, 
Um, so UX is now consisting of uh, these two uh, Rossmann variables and Z access components formally. Uh, this is ZX uh, psi Y, and eta X uh, psi Y plus eta Y uh, psi X minus ZX ZY. Uh, so defined in exactly the same uh, way, I've just replaced uh, this uh, Euclidean in our product here uh, by this, what's often called the symplectic in our product, which is appropriate for fermions or for Rossmann variables here. And then uh, the expectation um, is proportional to um, writing it down and then I will explain. So it formally takes exactly the same form as the other models. Uh, I'm omitting the external field H here again. So again, plays a less important role. Um, um, where this uh, d uh, eta x d psi x is the Grassmann integral. And that, that simply means that well, what you obtain here you substitute in all the definitions, you expand everything out, you get a polynomial in, in these generators, xi x, eta x, and this uh, Grassmann integral is nothing but selecting the top degree coefficient of this, uh, of this element. That's what it is. What's important here is that there's this factor one over zx. That's what makes it, uh, will make it hyperbolic. So this is sort of, a we, or you could view it as part of the interaction, but really it's it's part of the uh, of the measure. That's how it should be viewed because that then this this is uh, uh, okay. Why knowing the ux ui uh, is not uh, psi x psi y plus the eta? It's better for them because I thought that phi is as to psi and um, this one. Yeah, because earlier it was phi one x phi one y plus phi two x phi two y. Yeah, no, it uh, one has to be careful with the signs for the anti-commuting variables. I think this is the correct one, but anyway, what? So okay, and so but your, but your interaction there is is uh, it is quartic, right? I mean, that you you have to have ui is quartic because you got the z's. Yes, uh, if you write it all in the size, this is not, it looks uh, quadratic here, but if you, this ux dot ui is this, and the z's are quadratic. Yeah, so it is quartic in this. It is quartic in the fermionic variables. So the upshot is that that the connection probability in the boreal gas um, is equal to minus the spin spin correlation of, of the um, what I call the H02 model. So if you look at this for, and so this, so this is a boring gas. So if you compare this with the uh, formula we had had for the for the pot model and random cluster model, you see it's exactly what you get if you put q equals zero here. That's the minus in front of it, and then, and then you get the uh, connection probability for the abortion gas rather than the random cluster model. So is this a, at this point can you use a very Wagner type argument? At this point, exactly. So at this point, uh, the first theorem follows from a Merman Wagner type of argument. It, in fact, uh, there's a small caveat because the merman wagner argument usually uh, relies on uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and there's, one has to be a bit careful with the fermionic variables how to do the Cauchy-Schwarz. Um, let me explain in a second, but it's, in fact, one can, for a slight, for, so for a weaker statement than this, one can use exactly the same proof as the original merman wagner theorem. It's not going to give the polynomial bound. It's going to just say there's no macroscopic clusters. 
for the polynomial bound, one needs an improvement uh, analogous to the McBride Spencer theorem, which in this context. Uh, ours, would, ours would not work directly on this either. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, there's some, uh, I, I'll get there in a second. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's a preparation one needs to do before one can get to these arguments. So, but this improvement is due to uh, Sabo, uh, who, uh, uh, and there's an independent uh, uh, improvement, a similar improvement due to Pellet and uh, Cosma. Not sure if, the, if their improvement would work for the aboric gas. So these were developed for different models, which is for these hyperbolic sigma models with target space H22. But it turns out for the merman wagner theorem, they're, they're basically the same. Um, uh, I'll get there in a second, if, if there's time. Um, but OK, so the first, um, so as, as you pointed out, the two-dimensional result is, is not surprising once you know this, once you see this connection with the additional observation that this fermionic model here actually it, it's uh it has a continuous symmetry and i'll, I'll explain that a little bit uh, it really looks in many ways like the heisenberg model except that from uh, the o3 model um, so it has a continuous symmetry it's not a billion um but in many but for our purposes it's it's in many ways easier because the fermions are easier to work with than ordinary random variables so, so does so, that mean you expect uh, um, actually exponential decay? Yeah, exactly. That the conjecture is exponential decay for any beta. In two dimensions. Two dimensions, yeah. And the heuristics are pretty much the same <laughs> as for the Heisenberg model. The renormalization group. Yeah, so if you follow the renormalization group flow to second order, they're the same. Uh, um, um, so I should mention, so this, this uh, relation here is um, essentially due to uh, Caracciolo, Jacobson, Seller, Sokol, and Sportiello. They didn't formulate this in terms of the H02 model, but, uh, but they, uh, they, got the, they, they realized the important connection between these forests and uh, fermionic integrals. And um, we reformulated that in terms of the H02 model, but the essential part of this statement is due to them. Um, and um, OK, so let me explain what we can uh, do with that. So OK, or maybe I should summarize the punchline uh, here. Uh, uh, POTS model with uh, Q equals 0 think of as uh, the um, H02 model. That's on the level of the correlate. Sorry? That's just on the level of this correlate. Well, of course, the H02 model is, is not actually a probabilistic model. But, um, uh, well, it depends on the point of view. It's, it's, uh, anyway, its correlation functions have a clear probabilistic uh, significance, but yes. Um, OK, so, so OK, about the symmetry. So one a hallmark sign of continuous symmetry are word identities associated to continuous symmetries. And so, for example, in the H02 model, we have this word identity. We take the expectation of the Z field and say any fixed vertex say zero, respect to expectation beta H. Um, I haven't said, I think, what how the H is added here, but uh, let's just e to the H sum the X where X is over vertices. Um, to the sum over all vertices of the correlation functions of this two part function. So again, this is the same correlation, what identity you have for any nonlinear sigma model, such as the Heisenberg model or the XY model. Um, says if if uh, Z naught has positive expectation, the transversal two point function cannot be summable as H goes to zero. Um, 
And in fact, um, so there's, uh, you can write down, uh, so the, the symmetry of uh, this model, I guess, is the uh, connected component of the identity of the, of the uh, supergroup OSP12. Uh, it has uh, five infinitesimal generators. It's uh, much, my, my, it's much like a, a super a version of, of the O3 uh, group which you have for the Heisenberg model. And so in particular, um, so there's an analog of a rotation and that's the one that generates this word identity. Um, uh, okay, so, so as you already anticipated, the two-dimensional result with this, Knowing this, uh, the two-dimensional result is essentially uh, a version of the Merman-Wagner theorem. Let me brief before, and a three-dimensional result is something I will comment on afterwards, but let me briefly, there, there's a small, um, uh, I will not go into details here, but I'm happy to explain more later, but for the two-dimensional result, uh, there's a small, um, a step or there's a step you need to do to get to the point where you can use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality or Hilda inequality or things like that. And that is the following. So by uh, and ignore this if it, uh, it doesn't make sense to you, but it, I, I would just mention it briefly. There's this uh, supersymmetric localization theorem. Instead of taking this space uh, H02, one can also take this space H24, which is defined in exactly the same way, except so for H02, we have one pair of anti commuting variables plus the commuting variable Z. In H24, we have uh, two pairs of anti commuting variables plus one pair of commuting variables. Not going to go into details here, but uh, it can be defined the same way, and all, expecta all expectations of invariant observables are the same for both models. So in particular, this includes any product of the spins. They have the same expectation in, the, in both models. But the second model is richer, and it allows so-called horospherical coordinates, uh, uh, which uh, are complete pure, uh, in, in, in which, um, so, okay, let me write what the result is, and then it'll be clear. Um, so by supersymmetric theory uh, localization, we can also use H24 instead of H02. All expectations of the type we're interested in are the same. And then change to horospheric coordinates. The result of this procedure is the following. You can write the connection probability. What is all I'm not going to explain this here. I'm happy to explain this afterwards, but then uh, it's uh, basically a, a good analog of polar coordinates for hyperbolic space. Okay. So, but if you do this, uh, you uh, can obtain a, a, a representation for the two point function as an integral over a single uh, real variable per vertex. So over R to the lambda take out, let's say the origin, so one point here, e to the tx, so tx is the variable we're integrating over, e to the minus beta um, xy cosh x minus ty permanent uh, beta e. Uh, to the power of three halves, to the minus three t x, and so this is all over all t x. So now you've gotten rid of the fermions altogether, right? Yes. So I've I've gotten so I've, I've used this extension to go from h zero two to h two four, and then then you can change variables to horospherical coordinates, and then integrate out the fermions. They become Gaussian. You can integrate them out. They produce this determinant. What you're left with this is just a regular probabilistic integral, which is an exact formula for the two point function. And that's what you can. That's what you can so apply, Merman-Wagner. Yes. Yeah, so, 
uh, the most version of, of yeah so one can either so one can actually use the original version of Merwin Wagner then so here I've integrated out the fermions and the bosonic variables to use the real the original version of Merwin Wagner's theorem you leave the original you, you leave the bosonic uh, Gaussian variables in and apply uh, the original Merwin Wagner argument line by line to that and you comes out, there's no macroscopic cluster. To get the uh, McBride Spencer version, you use Sabo's version, which is uh, uh, applies to exactly this type of integral, except there is a one half instead of three half here, but it doesn't matter much for the argument. What, what was delta? Yeah, I haven't. So this delta is, uh, is a Laplacian with uh, T dependent weights. So it acts on a function F, F is a function on uh, lambda uh, in this way. So there's beta e to the Tx plus Ey, Fy minus Fx. T are just real variables, right? And T are just real variables, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is what we're using in two dimensions uh, or variants of this. You can write this integral like this and it becomes a gradient model uh, in, in these T variables. And maybe as a remark, this same type of measure is, is the one that well, it arose in the work of uh, uh, Spencer Zirnbauer and the Satori Spencer Zirnbauer and uh, was realized by Sabo and Therese that if you replace the three halves by a one half, this is exactly the mixing measure of the vertex reinforced jump process. Here it arises with the power three halves. Uh, okay, so um, so in the three dimensional case, we do not use this um, this trick to uh, change from H02 to H24, we stay with H02. And with the fermionic picture. Yeah, we're just working in the fermion. Work with this guy at all. No, we're not using this at all. Which staying in the fermionic picture. Um, this is valid in any dimension, but uh, this is what we're using in 3D. So it's convenient to rescale these variables psi as um, square root beta times another variable, which I'm going to write as psi bar, and eta as um, square root beta uh, eta, uh, psi. Uh, then you can write uh, what appears here, all of this together, um, including these factors of, uh, of z, which I'm We'll include these. This has the following uh, form. Um, well, uh, okay, so it's minus this here. Um, A free field like term, but fermionic. There is a term in the fermions. And then there is a quartic term in the fermions. Looks like this. And uh, that's it. So that's this density they are written just in terms of upsize. And um, um, so if you um, step back for a second. Um, what is Z? Z, there's no Z here. Um, yeah, so, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, so the Z <laughs> generates the quartic term. That's the, the Z axis. Ah, uh, is that one minus Z? Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. like a terrible rotation. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's a little computation that is the same as this. Okay. 
So it's a quartic now. And the, the quadratic quartic would be, would be integrable, but once you put the quartic term, it's not so simple. Yeah, so it's quartic. It looks, uh, if the size were replaced by, by ordinary uh, variables, it looks basically like a version of the phi 4 uh, model. Uh, so quadratic term, gradient squared. There is a uh, quadratic term, and then there's a quartic term, except that the quartic term has two gradients uh, in it. That's one difference. And uh, the other, uh, perhaps more essential difference, is that the constants multiplying the quadratic and the quartic term, they're the same, p sub h is equal to zero. And that has to do with the fact that this model has a geometric origin, that it came from this nonlinear sigma model, that these constants are the same. So I should hurry up a little bit at this point because I want to get to the point of the many questions that we don't understand. I realize it took me much longer to explain what we do understand, but there's many more things that we don't understand. So um, let me, um, uh, I will not, okay. So I, I will only say a few words on how we, how we do this and uh, um, what, and, and, spend then a few more words on what more precisely the conclusions we obtain are. So in two words, what we do is we use a fermionic renormalization group plus word identities. And a few more words, um, what is happening is that if we uh, decouple these two terms here. We pretend that as an FI4 model, this term is uh, sort of, uh, uh, where this, uh, this coefficient is given and this coefficient can be varied. So in a FI4 model, you'd vary this coefficient and there would be a choice for which you're at the critical point. We proceed in the same way here. And it turns out that, and that's where the word identities come in, that the choice where we're at the critical point corresponds exactly to h equals zero. Uh, I will not be able to explain this in a lot of detail here, but these are the two uh, keywords. I'd like to explain a bit more on what the type of uh, picture of symmetry breaking we obtain with this, because I think it's very, we, it's very complete in the sense that it's the same type of behavior we expect in other models, but we can see basically any, everything that, that we expect there. So for example, so we've already seen, I've already given you the statement of the percolation probability, and that corresponds to taking the spin-spin correlation at zero external field in finite volume. So as I mentioned, this is theta of beta squared plus two C of beta plus fractions. And so this is in finite volume, the uh, percolation probability. Um, in finite volume, if you take the expectation of Z naught, what identities imply that this is just zero. So it's exactly as in a Heisenberg model. If you take the expectation of the Z component, it's just a zero expectations. Uh, but that's not going to be the case anymore. If you put an external field, then take the infinite volume limit, and then H to zero. There's a phenomenon of symmetry breaking. And this term will, in fact, become equal to theta of betas. So more precisely, um, if you take the limit h to zero, but after the limit infinite volume limit, and look at, for example, of z naught, uh, this is, becomes theta beta, same theta. You can look at, uh, say, the, what I would call the transversal two point function, the same limit. Uh, so it's all the same limit here. Uh, this would become C of beta divided by beta x to the d minus two uh, plus corrections. 
So this is exact uh, here, there are corrections um, uh, to the leading order behavior. The C of beta is the same as this C, but no two. Um, so this corresponds in the percolation picture to the probability that there's a connection between zero and X, no connection to the ghost vertex we added that corresponds to the external field. You can also look at the correlation function that corresponds to the truncated correlations functions of the, of the radial field. So this would uh, decay. This also has an expression in terms of the percolation probabilities, but it's more complicated. So this limit would be uh, maybe minus C of beta squared, same C times beta squared times the percolation probability of beta times x to the 2d minus 2 plus lower order. Uh, and you can also uh, take a spin spin correlation, but now take this limit where first the infinite volume limit is taken, and then h goes to zero. And it turns out to leading order is the same as what you get here. These, these terms are the same. Uh, but the left-hand sides aren't exactly the same. These are all very consistent with spin wave type. It, it's, yeah, it's completely, uh, it's exactly what you would expect. Uh, but we're happy that we're getting exactly what, yeah. we, what <laughs> we expected. Uh, so it's, it's completely consistent. I guess the same statements would be true exactly uh, for the Heisenberg model, but uh, uh, so we don't have such precise, precise, precise information. Yes, we couldn't uh, prove it there. Uh, uh, this precision. So there's some interesting features. For example, this correlation function, what we get in the asymptotics is the same as this one, where we take the limits the other way around. But the observables aren't exactly the same. So in this case, we're looking at the connection probability in finite volume with zero external field. In the other case, so this one, this uh, probability here, is a sum of two probabilities. So it's the probability that there's a connection between zero and x plus the probability is there's no connection between zero and x, but there's but both points are connected to the ghost. Um, because this corresponds to the connection probability in the graph where the ghost is added. Um, now in ordinary percolation, the second probability would not contribute in the infinite volume limit. So, the eisenman keston newman uh, theorem. There's no, there's this uh, unique uh, infinite cluster. It's not true in this model. The second term can contribute. And uh, um, we cannot, um, may, so realize my time is running up. My uh, summary of my questions will have to be a bit more rapid. Um, but this is, for example, one of them. Uh, if you compare, this with the situation of the uniform spanning tree, which is in a finite graph, the uniformly chosen spanning tree, which corresponds to the beta to infinity limit of the abortion gas. In that case, it is known that, that there's a distinction between the infinite volume, finite volume behavior. Percolation probability for the spanning tree is completely trivial on a finite graph, it's always one. On the infinite graph, where you first take the infinite volume limit and then h to zero, in other words, you take a weak limit and then ask for the connection probability. Um, it is known that uh, due to P-mantle that the connection probability is one uh, for dimensions below four and a dimension five and higher, the connection probability decays like X to the minus D minus four. So, and, and in that case, you do have uh, uh, infinitely many infinite clusters, in fact. So anyway, there's lots of questions like that, which we expect there to be a very similar picture for the aboric gas, but we cannot uh, prove any uh, of, of that here. These are all relying on techniques related to loop erased walk and so on to sample spanning trees, which we don't have in this setting. Um, um, so since there isn't that much time, I think maybe I should keep my... Um, discussion of, um, of all the things we'd like to understand, but don't understand, maybe brief and uh, uh, give more of that to those who are interested later on, or 
I suppose I'd be here for a few days. So yeah. Anybody so but let me let, okay, let me mention the the keywords, and then I'll give you one of those. And I'll be happy to explain the the other ones later on. So one of them is uh, okay. What is the upper critical dimension of this model? The answer is, is six. Um, we cannot prove this, but there's little doubt it is. Um, at first sight, it's a little bit surprising because if you look at the field theory, it looks quartic. And typically we expect uh, cubic uh, field theory to use the critical dimension six, but uh, there's little doubt it's six. And I can explain um, why we expect that that's the case. Um, that's one. Uh, the second uh, point is, um, uh, well, the second point is one that I've already mentioned. It's this infinite volume picture, for example, by analogy with the uniform spanning tree. We expect a similar rich, even richer behavior at low temperature. You cannot prove any of that. Um, um, it's maybe also, wor also worth mentioning that there is, in fact, even, even on the deregular uh, tree with wire boundary conditions, there's a uh, interesting uh, picture. Um, this was uh, uh, done by uh, Philip Esso and uh, Gurab Ray and Xiao, who um, uh, showed that if you just look on the tree with wire boundary conditions, uh, the whole supercritical phase, the finite clusters are exactly the same as critical percolation on the tree. And then there's uh, an additional infinite clusters. So it, it looks, the finite clusters are exactly critical percolation on the tree the whole supercritical phase. Um, so similar picture, I, I guess, um, uh, okay, to the extent to which a similar picture persists in finite dimension is a question I could expand on, but I'm not gonna go to do that. Uh, maybe the final point to mention is that there is an interesting conjecture, which is that unlike the random cluster models with Q bigger than one, which is positively correlated, so the FKG inequality holds, this model is conjectured to be negatively correlated. Um, this conjecture remains open. Uh, uh, there's been some interesting uh, progress uh, in the last few years by uh, Brendan and Hu, Jun Hu, who's here, uh, and others, Anari and uh, co-authors, who proved that the partition function as a function of the weights, beta, edge dependent, is log concave. That gives a weaker statement, doesn't prove the negative correlation, it gives certain con uh, correlation inequalities which are sort of uh, in the same, in the right direction, but the negative correlation, uh, is, is, I think, is open. Yeah, Long concave is, uh, is the opposite of log convexity for Q greater than uh, one? Yes. So, the, so that's, that's interesting. Um, um, and would it be useful to know this, uh, but um, um, don't. Um, now, another question, which is one of my favorites, but also one of the most uh, vague ones is, um, is there a field theory for Q equals one? So in other words, for Bernoulli bound percolation, we have field theories for Q equals two, three, four, and for Q equals zero. They're all the, uh, is there a field theory that makes sense for Q? By Q. Sorry? By Q. Well, an exact one. Uh -huh. I mean, so also the phi cubed, I think, uh, so your point uh, that uh, percolation looks in many ways like a phi cube. I think uh, there, to me, it seems that it, it may be a little bit more subtle. Say this, this point, it behaves like phi cube, but it doesn't look like phi cubed. Uh, but it, it turns out it does seem to behave like phi cubed. Uh, Whatever that may be, because the but it's not clear what that is, right? right? <laughs> yeah, so it's not clear what it is. But anyway, um, um, so for example, on the complete graph, you can compute what the uh, what the size of the critical uh, cluster is. Uh, it's n to the to n to the two thirds or one third, depending on how you normalize it, and it's not one half as it would be in a quartic model. Uh, okay, so anyway, I think I've gone over my time anyway, and. I'll leave the expanding on these uh, on the on these various questions, and, and uh, there's a few I forgot now, but I'm not going to go into I'm not going to go into these now. So anyway, I'm happy to explain these and and various other questions uh, uh, to any of uh, those who are interested. Thank you very much.